program at the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery on Pafemolo University Hospital Complex. She completed her training in the year 1999 and joined the Obafemiolo University as lecturer one and the University Teaching Hospital Complex as an honorary, honorary consultant, oral maglofacial surgeon in the year 2000. She rose through the rank to become senior lecturer in 2003, associate professor in 2006, and professor in the year 2009. Professor Guinea is a fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, fellow West African College of Surgeons, and fellow of the International Board for the Certification of Specialists in Oral and Maglofacial Surgery. She was acting head, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, between August 2008 and July 2011 and is the current head of the department, August 2020 till date. She was the a DAD, DAAD scholar to the Department of Maxillofacial and Oral Surgery University of Pretoria in 2005. The American cleft palate craniofacial association visiting scholar 2010, World Health Organization mentor Menti Awardee, 2014, Tertiary Education Trust Fund Scholar, 2017 to 2019. She served as Editor-in-Chief, Nigerian Journal of Oral, Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, an official publication of Nigerian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons from 2016 to 2020. Currently, she is an Associate Editor for the Frontier Journal of Oral Health. She also served in the University Quality Assurance and Strategic Plan Monitoring Committee between December 2012 to 2017. Professor Guinea is a board member on the International Board for Certification of Specialists in Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. She's the president of the Nigerian Association for Cleft Lip and Palate. Professor Guinea is also a member of many professional associations, including Nigerian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, International Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, American Cleft Palate and Craniofacial Association, Association of Standardized Patients Educator, and Society for Simulation in Healthcare, among others. She serves as a reviewer for 33 scientific journals and has published two theses and 85 scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals. Her focus in research and clinical practice cover largely the management of maxillofacial injuries and orofacial clefts. She's also involved in pain management and medical education research. I hereby invite our inaugural lecturer today to present our lectures. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, principal officers here present, academic staff of the university, my distinguished colleagues, invited guests, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I stand before you here today in deep appreciation to the Lord God Almighty and to the entire university community for the privilege and honor to present the 368th inaugural lecture of the Obafemiola University here in the main bowl of Odudua Hall. This is the second inaugural lecture in the series from the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and the fifth from the Faculty of Dentistry. I was born in Oyalafi and I had my elementary education in Atiba Nursery and Primary School as well as Aquara Methodist School, Oyo. My father, who was a dutiful land surveyor, obtained a final transfer to Lagos State in 1973 and so the family moved to be with him. I completed my primary education in Iriti Primary School, Ikoi, and Reagan Memorial Baptist Primary School, Onike Yaba. I then proceeded to Methodist Girls High School, Yaba, for my secondary education, and Queen's College, Yaba, Lagos, for higher school certificates. For a higher institution, Obafe Meola University, then University of Ife, and Faculty of Health Sciences was my choice. I appreciate the immense, with immense gratitude the guidance of the fatherly roles of Professor Wande Abimbola, 
Like many in my generation, dentistry was not my first choice. I recall vividly the compulsory admission oral interview into the prestigious Faculty of Health Sciences. It held at the boardroom with panelists like Professors Soji Olusi, P.C. Egbe, Adebayo Adeyemo, and Stephen Odusanya, to mention a few. Sailing through the academic questions successfully, we ended up in a debate why medicine and not dentistry. Since medicine was my primary choice, I gave my points in favor of medicine. Late Professor Adebayo Adeyemo requested for time to enlighten me about dentistry. Professor S. A. Odusanya took over from him and gave more insight into the dental profession. So I reluctantly said, yes, it could be dentistry. And that was it. The orientation to dentistry, a Saturday introductory class handled by Professor Odusanya himself, made me realize that dentistry indeed was an excellent choice, but I knew it not. Those Saturday sessions gave my little mind a footing into what to expect in school and prospects of a career in dentistry. I graduated with the best result in my class and was offered automatic placement for internship at OAUTHC and University of Benin Teaching Hospital by the visiting external examiner, Dr. Christopher Iwu. I opted for internship in OAUTHC. During my National Youth Service Corps at Murtala Mohammed Specialist Hospital, Dr. Moshido Yenayi was a great source of encouragement who ensured that I had sufficient time to study and pass my primary examination. I remained with Kano State Health Management Board as a dental officer for a year and a half. My clinical interest in oral and maxofacial surgery is a fallout of many factors, most especially the role of a God-given professional father figure and a meticulous teacher, Professor Stephen Abimbola Udusoya, who gave opportunities for training and extraordinary guidance. Oral and maxofacial surgery is a specialty of dentistry whose practice covers the diagnosis, surgical treatment of diseases, injuries, and defects of hard and soft tissue in the oral and maxillofacial region. Historically, its true development began in the second half of the 19th century, with three surgeons shown above, paving the way for its emergence. What started then as a single specialty has grown into many subspecialties, and the number is still counting. I commenced my residency training at OAUTH in 1993 and concluded in 1999. I'm grateful to the teaching hospital management and leadership of Obafemiola University through the decades for providing an environment that's contributory to academic productivity and enlargement. I must not fail to recognize the God-sent helping hands of numerous colleagues who believe in me and with whom I've collaborated and continue to collaborate through different phases in my career. Rising in the first few years was particularly seamless as hard work and a focus on the goal of success seemed adequate. Further down the lane, rising seemed more challenging, but the captain of my soul upheld his will, and here we are today. At this junction, I would like to place on record with immense gratitude the names of men who, even without being conscious of it, were used of God to work a great deliverance in my career life. God knows everyone that played a part in this, and my prayer is that he will continually rise for them at their time of need. Professor Antonio Elujaba pronounced me a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery on 9th of January 2017, an elevation that was dated back to October 1, 2009. Over the years as a honorary consultant, maxillofacial surgeon in the University Teaching Hospital, I developed special interests and skills in the management of maxillofacial trauma, congenital orofacial malformations, cleft lip and palate in particular, and exodontia. Recently, I added the pursuit of a master's degree in health professions education and certificate in standardized patient education to my portfolio. This experience has enhanced my teaching and leadership skills a great deal. My pursuit of MHPE was part sponsored by the Tertiary Education Trust Fund, and I'm sincerely grateful for this. I've been molded by several experiences and many people, too numerous to mention. A few of the giants on whose shoulders I stand today are listed on this slide. I remain grateful to them. Maxillofacial injuries. As a young house officer at the OHC in 1989 90 management of maxillofacial injuries caught my attention. The Ife Ibadan Road at the time was the usual site of crashes, and it was rightly labeled a death trap. It was a season of lots of emergency life-saving surgeries, 
outcome of care with the master, Professor Odusanya, was impressive, and I was there in the management of facial trauma. One of the earliest trauma patients I met was Miss F.A. from Lagos, who was going to resume school in Ondo State and was to be dropped off by her dad. They arrived in Ibadan Road, Ileife, at about 6.30 a.m., and stopped over to fill the tank at the Ajib filling station. F.A.'s dad exited the filling station, not knowing that there was an oncoming vehicle with no headlamp on. There was a collision, which can be quite dramatic. The prevalent animal inflicting these injuries differ in various parts of Nigeria, depending on the use to which these animals are put. Pattern and trend of maxillofacial injuries. Against the background of previous studies in Ileife, I have studied the pattern of these injuries over the years. I observed and reported a change in injury pattern from predominant mandibular fractures in vehicular crashes to mid-facial bone fractures. This change was attributed to increase in number of motorcycle-related crashes between 2004 and 2009. Although motorcycles were unknown in Nigeria's public transport system, when cars became expensive and unaffordable, roads less motorable, taxis gradually folded up, and motorcycles took over the roads for their ability to navigate on motorable roads with ease. We then described prospectively the pattern of injuries sustained by patients involved in motorcycle-related crashes presenting at the OAUTC Ileife and Osman Danfodio University Teaching Hospital in Sokoto. Head-on collision was the commonest mechanism of crash, and a symmetrical pattern of injury, both of soft tissue and hard tissue located in the middle third of the face, was the usual pattern. We drew an association between the mid-facial bone fractures and motorcycle-related crashes, and also reported multiple pylon passengers in most events that led to crashes. Carrying multiple pylon passengers helped the passengers to cut costs and the riders to maximize their gain. The need to enforce the use of safety devices and education on proper number of passengers was emphasized in this publication. Unfortunately, the trend is worse today than it was then. In another prospective multi-center study that looked at the injury profile, severity, and risk factors that predispose victims of road traffic crashes to maxillofacial injuries in Nigeria, we confirmed the involvement of motorcycle riders in two-thirds of the crashes. Peak age incidence was 21 to 30 years, patients were predominantly males, and only 3% of them had crash helmets on with no face shield during the crash. Other risk factors implicated include alcohol use, substance abuse, lack of training on motorcycling, stray domestic animals on the roads, overspeeding, multiple passengers, fatigue, and bad road. Specific for maxillofacial injuries are poor compliance with crash helmet use and lack of standard crash helmet with full face visor. Applying the injury severity scale, we found more severe injuries in victims of crashes where multiple passengers were carried on motorcycles. A new craft that's been introduced to multiple pylon passenger is the extended seat of a motorcycle, which allows for up to eight adults to be carried on a single motorcycle, as shown in this video clip. With this craft, multiple pylon passenger has become a specialty and industry with us in Africa. Is there an end in view to this trend? Can this trend be curbed? The answer lies with me and you. In this series, we found 2.7% fatality in our patients, excluding an alarming 255 individuals that were brought in dead to the hospital. Further recommendations were made on enforcement of regulations around alcohol use, substance use, speed limit, observation, and multiple pylon passengers. My contribution on causes of road traffic accidents in developing countries to a book titled Traffic Accident Causes and Outcome revealed peculiar events leading to crashes in most developing countries as an interplay of human factors like street trading, roads, transportation aids, weather, dangerous overloading, multiple passengers, unrestrained vehicle occupants, Jonathan Shepard. The table on the slide summarizes the frequency of facial bone fractures and demographics of patients presenting in Ileife over a 37-year period. Peak age incidence has remained 21 to 30 years. 
a male preponderance has been sustained, but there were more facial bone fractures per person in the 2005 to 2013 series, subjecting greater impact on our patients. Crashes were commoner during the raining season, and they were attributed mainly to slippery roads, potholes, poor visibility, among other things. Treatment of these injuries was mostly by close reduction and immobilization. Since we had just 11% of our patients benefiting from open reduction and internal fixation at the time. The role of alcohol. We are examining the role of alcohol use in the etiology of road traffic crashes in Ileife. Against the acceptable breath alcohol concentration limit of 0.00025 milligrams per mil, we found and reported values ranging from 0.01 to 1.8 milligrams per mil in 68.9% of drivers at their duty posts. 92.6% of these drinks could be as high as 35 to 45% alcohol, and there are no age-appropriate restrictions to purchase or their use. We went on and then tried to understand the knowledge and practices of law enforcement agents serving in Oshun State about enforcing laws around alcohol use in drivers and riders. We found gross deficiencies in their knowledge and recommended BAC or BRAC was not known to many of them. Likewise, the use of devices in detecting alcohol in dangerous drivers. We equally importantly saw the need to adequately equip our law enforcement agents with tools for detecting driving or riding under the influence objectively. The use of breathalyzer should be a routine and not just a device that is vulnerable to bites. I've seen these injuries exclusively in women, and assailants were usually females too, in a variety of somewhat interesting scenarios. Obwekwe in Benin City, Nigeria, reported a female preponderance, while Donko and Bakas in Ghana and Patil in India reported a male preponderance. The assailant sometimes would inflict multiple on a victim that already has a figuring lip bite, like in this woman on the slide. She got an extra bite on her upper arm and her shoulder. In my experience, the excise portion of the lips were usually unaccounted for, but it was recovered in one of my... Experience with managing these cases has shown clearly that the African lip, unlike the Caucasoid, is really forgiving. Loss of over a third of the African lip still allows for some degree of correction and healing without tissue transfer. I say this to showcase the beauty of the Africans and the Caucasians' success. At subsequent appointments, patients often expressed satisfaction with the outcome and did not return for further interventions, like in this young woman. At other times, the defects are larger. I've applied the principle of local tissue traction and meticulous wound care to attain some degree of closure. These measures prevent the severely disfiguring sequel of healing by secondary intention in patients who could not afford reconstructive surgery. Her lower lip beaten off by her daughter's mother-in-law during a scuffle over who takes custody of their grandson. She recovered their vault piece and presented at a private hospital where it was reimplanted. She then presented at OUTHC with the infected necrot. I excised the bit, leaving a dirty infected wound. Following meticulous wound care and antibiotic therapy, the wound became clean. I then instituted local tissue traction in stages. This is the outcome that we have. My desire for a final touch in terms of scar revision. My desire for a final touch in terms of scar revision has not met with the patient's financial commitment till date. But she continually tells me I'm happy with this outcome. False. Mr. S.A. was a palm wine tapper who went to tap wine like he's done for decades. On this fateful day, the rope with which he climbed snapped. His axe went down ahead of him, and he landed face down on his axe. He sustained these injuries to his face and a perforating injury to his back. He arrived at OUTC 24 hours of sustain, within 24 hours of sustaining his injuries and he was stabilized. Strangely, his relatives became reluctant to release funds for his care, while the patient also expressed hopelessness and continually requested for lethal injection. After much appeal, 
His wife informed me that the money required for his surgery was available, but she needed me to promise that Mr. S.A. would leave, that S.A. should pass on in that condition. They would require money for his burial, hence the need to hold on the money. I assured her that by the grace of God, Mr. S.A. would leave, and indeed, he lived. Indeed, he survived and recovered satisfactorily. Sadly, most, if not all, pan wine tappers and other tree climbers carry on in this business daily using the same device. Gunshots. Facial gunshot injuries in Ileife and environment was somewhat seasonal in frequency and pattern. Up till 1999, all cases involved civilians. They sustained accidental discharge injuries with bullets. Half of the time, this caused self-inflicted injuries. One out of four of our patients at the time died from their injuries. Then we recommended that the Nigerian law enforcement agent needed to devise strategies for monitoring the sales, accusation, and use of locally manufactured. We tend to see more severe injuries now with poor rate in individuals who abuse substances. Facial dog bites and facial burns. This occurred quite infrequently in my series. The dogs that inflicted bites were usually domesticated and sometimes familiar with the children that they beat. Bites were provoked 75% of the time. And sadly, one out of four children died from their injuries. We implicated in part the unavailability of anti-rabies vaccine at the time and made a case for ready access to the vaccine in our hospital. And this has since been addressed. Our official burns caused inhalational injuries, which accounted for severe morbidity and mortality. Having managed a lot of facial burns, together with my colleagues in related specialties, we ex adults, as well as teachers and parents. We therefore emphasize the need for training on burn injury prevention at all levels in our society. Treatment options for mandibular fractures and their consequences. Two treatment methods for mandibular fractures are the MMF and the ORIF. While ORIF is more invasive, costlier, and often a time-consuming if adverse consequences will be averted. Complications of maxillofacial injuries. When injuries occur, there are consequences. Some are mild and partly reversible, but others are not. We examined the epidemiology of blindness in maxillofacial injured patients presenting at four Nigerian centers. Three out of every hundred maxillofacial injuries resulted into blindness. Road traffic crash was the leading cause of injury resulting in blindness, followed by assault and gunshots. In all, 61 eyes were blinded in 56 patients. 28 of these patients had their blindness in the left eye and 23 in the right eye. There were five patients that were blinded bilaterally, and there was a particularly disturbing case of bilateral traumatic globe enucleation in an assaulted patient. Hypertrophic scars and keloids. Hypertrophic scars and keloids are consequences of injuries, and they are more prevalent among Africans. They can be quite disfiguring, unsightly, and unsettling, thus requiring intervention, especially in young and middle-aged individuals. Using intralesional tramsinolone injection versus excision combined with radiotherapy, flattening of lesions was achieved in 81% of scars managed with tramsinolone intralesional injection, while 58% of those treated by excision combined with radiotherapy reflat during the course of the study. The difference was statistically significant, and so we concluded that intralesional injection of tramsinolone is significantly more efficacious than excision combined with radiotherapy in the management of facial keloids. The slide above shows a patient who was involved in a road traffic accident, developed keloid over time, and was managed successfully with intralesional tramsinolone injection. Injury prevention. Prevention is absolutely cheaper and better than cure. While perfect cure can be elusive with most injuries, on this note, Injury prevention became a passion for me. I developed and submitted a proposal to the hospital, to the hospital for a hospital-based management trauma registry at the OAUTHC. Although the proposal lacks funding till date, its importance remains valid. I hope and pray that the reality of its potentials will come top on our priority list soon, and this will put, will put to effective use, especially with our ongoing record system, 
to electronic medical record system. I wish to emphasize again that this initiative has helped to bring down the incidence of injuries in many parts of the world. Congenital orofacial malformations, orofacial clefts. On the 9th of February 2019, the Daily Devotional, Daily Manor, authored by Pastor Dr. William Falon Shokumui, featured a topic behind every challenge. The text was John Gospel chapter 9, verse 1 to 7. And that was an account of a man who was born blind. Christ's followers asked an intriguing question. Who did sin, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Our official clefts refer to congenital malformations around the face and mouth, including isolated cleft lip, cleft lip and palate, isolated cleft palate, and facial clefts. About 7.3 million people worldwide have orofacial clefts, and almost 220,000 children are added every year. The prevalence varies with population, gender, and socioeconomic class. Individuals of African descent have the least prevalence, while the Asians have the highest. Cleft lip and palate is a major oral health condition, contributing to the global burden of oral disease, with complete rehabilitation possible if treated appropriately environmental factors in isolation or combination have been implicated. Man's belief about the causes of orofacial clefts is pretty much the same today as it was in the days of the disciples. I examined the beliefs of Nigerians about the causes of orofacial clefts and a catalog of interesting beliefs emerged. Most of these beliefs centered around the woman or mother and sometimes the child. Mother was labeled a witch, never a father, it was punishment for mother's infidelity. That was the belief of some. Others said the mother was adulterous. That's why she would give birth to a child like that. Or the mother walked in the sun while she was pregnant, or she caught the mouth of an animal. At other times, the child, child is tagged evil. While very rarely, the father is said to have gone hunting and shot at a strange beast or animal. Some of the beliefs upheld in Nigerian communities today emanated from far away in China centuries ago, and different cultures globally appear to embrace similar beliefs. Sadly and closely related to the cultural beliefs is the plague of infanticide, which goes on subtly and unnoticed amongst us. Aside, some cannot afford surgeries for their children, Others are unaware of the possibility of a repair. And painfully yet, others believe that these children are evil, unclean, and should not live. But how can you call unclean what God has made clean? It's time we all join a campaign that says no to infanticide and yes to corrective surgeries. Every child deserves to live. The smile train and clip care in Nigeria. Thankfully, with the support of the Smile Train, financial constraint is no longer a barrier to receiving quality cleft care throughout Nigeria today. Smile Train is the world's largest cleft-focused charity, bringing smile to children and adults with cleft lip and palate, and in 30 countries of the world, including Nigeria, through corrective surgeries. Together with colleagues in the College of Health Sciences, we secured a Smile Train treatment grant, which has continued to fund cleft surgeries for indigent children and adults since 2006. I place on record with self, the selfless contribution of the Smile Train staff from 2006 till date for their very terrific support of cleft care in Nigeria. The Deloy Greenwood, Troy Reinhardt, current senior, senior vice president, and Juna Kalsi, Remy Adeshim, in Kiruka Obi, the current vice president and regional director of Africa, Victoria Awaizie, who is present here with us, Senior Program Manager, West Africa. Paul Lobby, Helpline Officer, and Adai Zemoyelu, Program Assistant, who is also in the house. As at the end of 2022, Smile Train has supported over 33,000 cleft surgeries in Nigeria alone, and the number is growing daily. Thank you for your powerful presence in Nigeria. Charity, they say, begins at home. And in my role as the president of the Nigerian Association for Cleft Lip and Palate, I'm compelled to challenge Nigerian philanthropists and Nigerian-based non-government organizations to extend the hand of generosity towards available aspects of cleft care for Nigerian children. 
inclusion of every aspect of cleft care in the Nigerian Health Insurance Authority list is long overdue and most desirable. In my hands, I've had the unique God-given privilege of receiving individuals born with cleft lip and palate from different states in the country whose care continues to give me the patients and their parents overwhelming joy and huge sense of gratitude to God. Parents' disappointments and clinicians' commitments. Expecting a perfect baby, but getting a gift slightly less. Parents present in a hospital broken by anxiety that are sometimes emotionally tasking for me to handle. Their anxiety emanates from self-examination, disappointment, guilt, regrets, and self-blame. I've seen guilt reflected in questions asked by parents to explore their roles or their actions and inactions as potential causes of cleft in their babies. Over and above this come the challenges associated with feeding the newborn, stigma in the society, absconding husbands or fathers, mothers never abscond, and family rejection to highlight some of the problems confronting patients and parents. The multifaceted challenges in orofacial clefts call for comprehensive care by a multidisciplinary team. Our unalloyed commitment has established a tradition of reassurance and pledge to receive parents' phone calls for all manner of help at all hours of the day from every location where our parent, patients are. Sharing pre- and post-operative pictures of managed cases and fostering relationship between parents of treated and untreated patients while attending the clinic has been very helpful. Skill development and training opportunities. In 2005, when I served as a dad scholar at the Department of Maxwisha and Oral Surgery in the University of Pretoria, South Africa, I worked mostly with Dr. Kotbuto, and that experience launched me into my first major training in cleft care. In 2007, I met Dr. Richard Teshner, and friendship and network for a lifetime began. He soon became my ACPA International Scholarship Sponsor, who guided me through receiving training from three top institutions were frequent attendees at the clinic. One can only imagine what emotional and psychological trauma this patient had been through before coming to the point of care. By the grace of God and with every sense of humility, I continue to be instrumental to bringing great transformation to the faces and lives of these patients, making their broken pieces into masterpieces, bringing untold joy to my heart, and remaining the reason and source of inspiration to do more. The picture on the slide depicts a 25-year-old lady who presented to the clinic and had her surgery. She attended a few post-operative review sessions, and then we couldn't find her again. Enquiries into her absence from the subsequent clinic appointments revealed that she was busy planning for her wedding. She got married within 18 months of her surgery, and today she's a happy wife a mother. Much older patients attended the clinic at the time. A few of them presented with broken pieces from unsuccessful attempts at earlier repairs, thus requiring a second touch, which by the grace of God, converted their broken pieces to masterpieces. Again, the craft of a transforming surgery brought about a change to this woman, and that added on her a smile and a beautiful hair to this patient, her subsequent post-operative outpatient review became very colorful. The fact that we had older patients living with cleft motivated us to do more cleft awareness campaign. However, the message still needs to go around. Once again, I commend the outstanding effort of the SMILE train with this noble task. Management of cleft lip and palate in younger children. Over time, the mean age of our patients began to drop, signaling the end of a harvesting phenomenon. Patients were then mostly babies and toddlers with different forms of cleft deformities. Here is a five-month-old baby with unilateral cleft lip and palate before and after her lip repair. And next, you have a male patient who presented at the age of one week, and the next picture to that shows him at three months before his surgery and last one 18 months after his repair. This child is ready for school without any stigma. 
It is indeed a privilege to partner with the Creator in the work of reconstruction, as outcomes, to say the least, are humbling for a mere mortal like me. At other times, the defects affect both sides of the lip. The kids on this slide, not a set of twins, but similar fate befell them, as both were born with bilateral cleft lip. They attended the clinic at about the same time. Having survived stigmatization, bullying, and name-calling, both had smile train supported surgeries and have since marched on in life. Today, they are in tertiary institutions. And the patient to your left, particularly with whom I'm in touch, is in the College of Health Technology. Did bilateral cleft lip pre and post operatively with a satisfactory outcome. Cleft part, which may exist in isolation or coexist with cleft of the lip from birth. It has the potential to impair feeding and speech in affected children and adults. While isolated cleft palate, with isolated cleft palate, a patient has normal facial appearance, but the intraoral defect, which often gives itself out as nasal speech or nasal regurgitation, is present. The surgery in this patient, likewise that of the child next to him, as intelligible speech was gained in all, but usually and more perfectly in the younger child, who today is advancing educationally, socially, and emotionally. His broken pieces, now masterpieces, by the grace of God. <laughs> Undetected cleft palate in children, lingering into adulthood is unthinkable but common. Ongoing awareness efforts directed at every level of healthcare provider is making a change already. After all, babies always cry at birth. A routine peep into the mouth of an, by an attending health worker or even the parents may be all that's needed to detect cleft palate early. In 2012, I was invited by Dr. Samuel Berkovit to contribute a chapter to a book titled Cleft Lip and Palate Diagnosis and Management. It was an opportunity to document the common palatoplasty techniques practiced in Africa. It should be noted, however, that those documentations over time would change as newer techniques evolve to modify what we did then and give better outcome. Rare cleft cases. Sometimes the presentation, the story and picture appear complex, yet we go from broken pieces to masterpieces. Here is a case of a congenital maxillomandibular fusion, an exceedingly rare condition in a Nigerian child who presented at the age of six weeks. Mother had routine antenatal care and was delivered in the hospital. Baby's birth weight was 2.75 kg. Mother complained of his inability to suck. Examination revealed a band that connects his tongue to his palate and his upper and lower jaw. This child failed to thrive as he weighed 1.5 kg when he was six weeks. He presented with features of respiratory distress, lethargy, and cleft palate. An immediate nutrition plan was instituted for him, despite industrial action in the hospital at the time. His weight improved rapidly from 1.5 kg to 4.85 kg in three weeks. With sustained growth and development, he was soon scheduled for safe surgery. At this point, I would like to acknowledge the excellent contribution of late Professor Jerome Boluaji Elushion in co-managing this patient right from presentation. He co-managed this powerful memory of Professor Elushion continue to be a blessing. I acknowledge also the house officers and registrars in the unit who nursed this child during the health workers' industrial action. The patient soon had his uh, fibrous band released, and subsequently, he had a palatoplasty. The safe relief of his fibrous band was accomplished with the outstanding anesthetic expertise of Dr. Anthony Adenekon. This child today is a 10-year-old primary school pupil who is doing well all round, and his case clearly demonstrates that although it looked like all hope was lost at the beginning, God saw us through, and again, we had a transformation from broken to masterpieces. (laughs) 
other rear clefts. Rear clefts may run through the midline of the upper lip to the nose. We call it tercia class zero. Or sometimes across the angle of the mouth, class seven. The patient with tercia class zero shown on this slide had corrective surgery of her lip and nose, and the satisfactory outcome is what you see. Next, the other patient who has bilateral tercia seven had a relatively big mouth, a condition known as macrostomia. The patient had challenges with effective feeding before surgery, but once her defect was corrected, she went from a broken piece to a masterpiece, being able to feed very well and gained weight quite rapidly. The enhanced quality of life and outcome in my patients are reasons to desire to do more. Painfully, despite the outcome that we see, there's still a tendency for parents and members of extended family and the community to tag these children evil. Sometimes they go on to directly or indirectly. My message again is, let these children live, as their broken pieces will be transformed into masterpieces if you give us a chance. Etiology, risk factor of orificial cleft. We examined the characteristics of 157 patients and parents patients with cleft lip and palate aged one day to four months. And we compared their characteristics with 157 unaffected children and their parents. The aim was to identify the risk factors in the study population. Apart from factors that have been documented in literature before, we found some few factors in our community. And they, those are the children born to mothers aged less than 20 years or equal to 20 years, Mothers who volunteered history of attempted abortion, primary gravid status at birth of index child, lack of antenatal care, and occupations in parents like tailoring or fashion designing and hairdressing. We concluded that exposures to a variety of chemicals and dye pigments through this occupation may account for an association. In a similar vein, we examined the seasonal variation in the birth and conception of children with cleft lip and palate and we documented that most conception of children with non-syndromic cleft lip and palate occurred in the dry season. Several nutritional and environmental factors that characterize the dry season in Nigeria may be implicated. Ongoing studies are exploring these factors and hopefully our findings will contribute to formulating effective preventive strategies. Patients and parents often inquire, will this defect recur in another child? or are subsequent generations likely to come down with this defect? Research in genetics holds the key that unlocks the answers to some of these important questions. In collaboration with colleagues in almost every continent of the world, we have undertaken some studies structured to unravel the genetic component of some cases with Professor Aziz Boutali as the lead researcher and his team at the University of Iowa doing an excellent job on this subject. The outcome of care can also be a concern. This can be measured objectively. I mentored a trainee who examined the outcome of unilateral cleft lip repair using modified cleft evaluation profile administered to patients pre and post operatively. This result was compared with clinicians' objective measurements. Parents demonstrated a higher level of satisfaction following primary cleft lip repair compared with clinicians. However, the differences in rating were not statistically significant. We hope that ultimately this and other outcome studies will help us in formulating tools that would constitute part of our national protocol for reporting outcome of care. Challenges of care. We examine the anesthetic challenges, airway events, and the role and importance of preoperative pre hematological investigations in our patients. 18% of our patients had perioperative complications, but thankfully, in patients undergoing orofacial cleft surgeries were studied also. 14 complications were recorded, but none of these complications were predictable by the result of our preoperative screening test. We concluded that routine laboratory tests had minimal impact on the outcome of orofacial cleft surgeries in our study population. However, Hematocrit screening may be appropriate, particularly in clinically pale patients. Other congenital anomalies. At other times, children present with congenital anomalies that may be life-threatening. This baby was born with a fluid-filled sac in his mouth. 
a condition known as congenital heterotropic gastrointestinal cyst of the tongue. He had challenges with feeding. He was monitored closely for proper feeding, but more importantly, to ensure that he was breathing normally. This lesion typically filled up in a couple of days, so I drained it aseptically over time until he was stable enough for surgery. His cyst was enucleated safely, and this child is living well today. The other baby, the other baby had a sublingual epidermal cyst, which is similar, but not as life-threatening as the earlier one. He had the hotlines that parents were to call if they sensed any trouble. He also had a cyst enucleated, and today he's doing very well. Both procedures are uneventful, lesions benign, and patients have continued to live normal life. Exodontia. I examined the reasons for tooth loss among patients presenting at our hospital over a seven-year period. I documented for the first time a change from periodontal disease as the leading cause of tooth loss in our population, as opposed to, I, I documented dental caries as the leading cause, as opposed to periodontal disease, which was previously documented. This pattern was attributed to dietary changes, increased refined sugar consumption in our population. Pain perception in exodontia. In a bid to understand the best choice of anesthetic agents, we investigated the residual analgesic anesthetic agents following surgical extraction of mandibular third molars. Two double-blind randomized control trials compared 2% lignocaine with 0.5% bupivacaine and 2% lignocaine with 4% articaine. The onset of action, intraoperative anesthetic properties of all three local anesthetic agents did not differ significantly. However, bupivacaine and articaine offered significantly superior post-operative analgesic properties when compared with lidocaine. We concluded that bupivacaine and articaine be favored in the management of impacted mandibular third molars and recommended a departure from lignocaine for these procedures in the interest of our patients. Dry socket. Dry socket is the commonest complication of dental extraction. I reported an incidence of 4.1% for the first time in any Nigerian population. Satisfactory healing was reported most times with a change of zinc oxide which in all dressing on alternate days. My subsequent prospective study on dry socket identified a few unique risk factors as listed on this slide. In our practice at OAUTHC, this is the picture that we published. And these findings are helpful in ensuring the prevention of dry sockets. Medical education. Sankofa is a word the twin language of Ghana that translates to go back and get it. It is represented either by a stylized heart shape or a bird with its head turned backwards while its feet face forward carrying a precious egg in its mouth. The importance of Sankofa is in its expression of reaching back to knowledge gained in the past and bringing it to the present to make meaningful progress. The egg in its mouth represents the gem or knowledge of the past upon which wisdom is based and the generation to come that would benefit from that wisdom. History has it that in 1981, WHO supported Professor S.A. Odusoya in the Faculty of Health Sciences to acquire health professions education training at the University of Illinois in Chicago. The WHO at the time planned to establish a regional center for health professions education in West Africa with headquarters in Ileife, Nigeria, where other parts of Africa will derive guidance. The, award, the awardee completed a training and published the thesis titled Determining the Organizational Structure for a Nigerian Health Professions Faculty Development Program. This title addressed his focus and a need of the Nigerian Health Professions Education System at the time. However, the structure that Odusan and WHO desired is yet to attain full realization in Nigeria. I have since been back at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and my MHPE thesis, titled self Passive Preparedness for Practice Among Graduates of Nigerian Medical and Dental Schools, examined the preparedness of 1,360 graduating students and interns throughout Nigeria using a modified instrument of the AAMC and ADEA graduation questionnaire. 
The GQs are applied annually to all graduating medical and dental students in USA. It is not yet native with us to hear from our trainees routinely. Findings of my thesis proved beyond reasonable doubt the huge resource in feedback that we need to begin to tap into. For instance, respondents naturally express desire for integrated learning experience, more time for clinical teaching, desire for more hands-on session, orientation to internship, more clinical practice, among other things. The postgraduate medical education system in Nigeria deserves a similar attention. Medical education draws from the need of the society to modify training curriculum and meet those needs. Using geriatric dentistry, I collaborated with colleagues from different continents to examine how much attention geriatric dentistry is receiving globally. We found that geriatric dentists don't cause in most dental schools and in most countries, including Nigeria, even though the need of the older adults are unique. India, with an increasing aging population, is however set to address this need. I'm part of a team that developed proposals for the much needed incorporation of geriatric dentistry into us. Hopefully, this project should be here with us in Nigeria soon. My pursuit of MHPE has helped me to achieve a desire I announced right from the inception of my teaching career. I'm equipped, prepared, and I look forward to contributing my quota in addressing this and other concerns backed up by relevant organizations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, recommendations, a desirable and achievable collective task. Establishment of trauma registries locally and nationally will go a long way in attaining this goal, effective injury prevention. Public enlightenment programs on injury prevention, use of safety devices, and appropriate safety precautions should be ongoing at all levels in our society. Our official clefts can be managed successfully, followed up to completion of comprehensive care beyond surgical care alone, free of charge where treatment is unaffordable. Funding for research of our official clefts, outcome of care, among other aspects of cleft care should be instituted. Once again, while appreciating the smile train, I challenge NGOs in Nigeria and the federal government to prioritize the comprehensive care of children born with orofacial cleft and step into our need list as listed in Appendix 2. In the spirit of Sanko, we should still take a lead in Africa. It's time we begin to obtain and put feedback from our trainees to meaningful national use and teach the rest of Africa to do the same. A carefully structured Nigerian graduation questionnaire will help in extracting the information for improving our training yearly. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, in closing, I read a quote from Nick Vuichi, an Australian-American evangelist Amelia Syndrome. And Nick says, beautiful things will come from your broken pieces when you give your broken pieces a chance. His life indeed is a living testimony and perfect example of this quote. The life around us teaches us the same lesson of the beauty of broken things. Broken flowers give perfume. Broken chains impact freedom, give grains. It takes broken grains to give bread, and broken bread gives strength. Hearing. <laughs> Herein lies the beauty of broken things. I can only pray today that our dear nation will find strength and healing for her brokenness. Even in this month of love, by the special grace of God, I look forward to more years of bringing beauty out of broken pieces. Appreciation. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed a product of the grace of God, and I owe him a lifetime and eternity of gratitude, adoration, and praises both physically and virtually, I'm immensely grateful. Without you, there would have been no event. Thank you for coming. I thank the Egbe Atun Lushe of Ijisha land. Thank you, Saz and Mas, for being here. Sincere gratitude to all patients that have passed through me at every level of care delivery. 
Thank you, patients, for giving me your broken pieces and granting me an opportunity to tell these stories today. I would like to seize this opportunity to thank and most sincerely appreciate my parents, late Sovio John Babatunde Adeoromo Adewale and Mrs. Elizabeth Omotunde Adewale for bringing me into this world and for giving me the opportunity to be educated morally, academically, and spiritually. I love you and God bless you. Still in the family, I want to appreciate my brothers, great, loving, unforgettable companions through my childhood and part of my adulthood, late Mr. Adeolu Adewale and late Mr. Babaji Adewale. I thank my sisters and friends, Mrs. Adeolu Banjo and Mrs. Adeto Radishino and their spouses. Thank you for the love and support that you show. I thank my teachers at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of education. I would like to appreciate my lecturers in the university who laid the foundation on which I continue to build and have added indelible colors to my life. I appreciate my numerous uncles and aunties, and I thank you for the joy you bring. Uncles and aunties in law and their spouses, I sincerely appreciate you all, sir. To my dear sister, social health worker, Mrs. Adebo and Mrs. Iba and their team, thank you for the miles you cover to reach our patients and to meet their social need. I'm also very grateful to the leadership of Oba Pemeolo University, College of Health Sciences, and OAUTHC down the years. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been molded academically and spiritually by Pastor William Folloran Shokumuyi. <laughs> and I owe him immense gratitude. My first contact with Pastor was as a Form 3 student in 1978-79 at the Free Vacation School held at Baptist Academy, Obaniko Lagos. Then pastor was a lecturer at Unilag, who organized a free vacation school for secondary school students to prevent us from roaming the streets. We were taught mathematics, English language, and moral instructions by undergraduates from the University of Lagos at the time. There I had the gospel message for the first time in my life, and I met Christ. This encounter is foundational and central to all that I am today. I also, I also would like to thank and appreciate all my fathers and mothers in the Lord. Pastor and Mommy J.B. Adeniron, Pastor and Mommy G.O.A. Olofintui, Pastor and Mommy F.K. Oguntui, Pastor and Mommy Ayuaf and Sister Adedogun. Thank you for the anointing and grace you impart continually. You are pillars of support. To my beloved brothers and sisters in the family of God in Ife region, Ijesha region, and worldwide, too numerous to mention, but whose names are written in the book of life, I thank you all. Professional children, too numerous to list, but ably represented children, Olai Wola, Oluwa Sheon, Ife Oluwa, Oluwa Damilola, and Oluwa Sheyi. And for our latest addition, Queen Victoria, Thank you for the joy you bring and for being great source of blessings. I love you all very dearly. And to my crown and Thank you for being a loving and caring husband. Yes, two months and 13 days ago, I love you and will forever do. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for gracing this occasion and for your kind attention. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir.